Are they going to do it? They may do it just because it's there. They may do it because they can sell it. I don't know if you've seen recently, but there have been a number of things published in the last probably six months. There's a new site up, essentially an eBay type site, that sells exploits. People find them in products. Then they put them up for auction to see who wants to buy them. They don't care why they're doing it. They just are concerned that they can find them and then that they can make money on doing it. So their purpose and drive is to make money selling these exploits. Who wants to buy these exploits? I don't know. Might be a competitor trying to take me out of business. Might be somebody who has revenge, a former employee that didn't like being laid off last year. Could be a whole lot of reasons. Yeah, question. Um, yeah, have you, um, have you heard about the iPhone being hacked? Yep. Uh, has that influenced your... Uh your team at all? Nope. Ron, you may want to repeat the question. Okay. Yeah, I think they're, they've got microphones back there, but I'll repeat it. The question was, was I aware of the iPhone uh, and the attacks on it to essentially remove it off the AT&T network and move it as well as change some of its feature sets? And the second part of that question was, um, it, has it changed the impact to what my team is? And the answer is, yes, I'm very much aware of it because that's a part of the industry that we watch very carefully. Uh, two, we expected it. And three, we have been dealing with similar problems for probably 10 years within Motorola, uh, trying to keep those same types of lock controls in place. Um, and we think we've done a much better job. Of course, we've got 10 years of background where Apple hasn't only been doing it for just a very short period of time. So, yeah, I don't think it's changed what we've done. It just, it just has, it has strengthened the things that, yes, we're aware of that space, and it's an ongoing process. Um, in fact, one of the things that we, we did do um, a couple of years ago, we did a study in Motorola phones to try to understand what was the uh, community of uh, people of interest in you know, kind of doing uh, you know, gray market or black market kind of work. Um, and the answer was they thought the general community was about 6 million or so for Motorola phones, people interested in either attacking or using attacks on phones. Uh, we narrowed down the, uh, the environment to about three to 500 actual you know, real-life smart people that are actually doing attacks on a regular basis, uh, trying to figure them out, trying to sell them on the Internet, uh, and so on. In fact, we've, we're, we've been tracking one group that we're very much aware of, and I won't give too much data on it, but a couple of years ago we had some intelligence that said they had about 34 to 40 full-time people doing nothing but attacking our phones. Okay, so that's the kind of stuff. So we've been very much aware of those kind of situations. So once you've gotten past that, the next question then, and I kind of alluded to it already, is, is are we there yet? If I look at what security is, is looking at within most of these products, I'm looking at software and hardware features. These are becoming smaller, faster, cheaper by the, by the month. Features and functions are being thrown onto our products um, a lot. If I look at a cell phone a couple of years ago, it made nice calls. If I look at a cell phone today, well, let's see, it's got cameras so that I can take pictures. It's got a video camera on there. I can do video editing if I want to on a small screen. And I don't do that, but I think there are people that claim that they do. Uh, it can do your email. It can do uh, uh, music. It can do whatever you want to on that little device. And all of that is just coming faster and faster and faster as the hardware gets smaller and cheaper. But as I said, the attack tools, the equipment to do that attack tools, also are becoming smaller, cheaper, faster um, almost every year. We have significant pressure from our competitors. Somebody like Apple comes in with the iPhone and introduces a new kind of paradigm in how the user interface should work. Everybody has to scramble to put that on top of everything else that they already have. And a cons uh, consumer expectations. All it takes is for a group of people to say, I really like that particular feature in that particular product. Everybody else has to run and do it. These things are getting bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. From a security capability, they're under continuous attacks. As I told you, we already have this rather sizable community of people that are very interested in figuring out how to break in uh, to products. They can steal features. They can get services that they don't pay for. They can put stuff in that they think is cool but maybe has uh, some adverse effect on the network. Um, and it's a very changing environment. So our problem is if I build it today, probably in 6 months, 12 months, 18 months at the outside, it's probably not sufficient anymore because of these constraints. So the product team that's used to going into a set of software developers and say, build me this feature, I put it on my product, thank you very much, go on to the next one, and they're done, are used to the same, that kind of approach. In the security world, I come in and say, here's, a, here's an approach that will protect these assets. Thank you very much for putting in. Twelve months later, I'm back to that same product group. Here's a new way or an improved way to protect those same assets. And they say, well, we did that last year. I say, well, that's true. You did that last year, but 
You're not doing it this year because the attack tools and the adversaries have gotten that much better. You need to improve and change it. So it turns out that if you're in the security field, particularly for the product level, that's okay because that means if you start now, you'll probably still be doing it by the time you retire. So as long as you don't feel like you have to be a type of person that says, I did it, I'm done, I can move on, that's probably all right. You don't really want to be in this field. If it's okay to have that constant challenge and constant motion, this is probably okay. So that's kind of the attitudes that we're seeing. We're looking at um, those kind of functions and why those things all kind of wrap up together in the way we're doing product analysis. What I want to do is just kind of very briefly introduce um, a project that we've been doing uh, in my lab for the last two years or so, and that we're just getting kind of close to that point of bringing out uh, into the, the open market. Um, as I said, I can point you to some uh, additional papers and stuff that we've written on this topic. Um, if you have an interest in going into some more detail, I'll just try to introduce it to here. One of the elements that we have inside of processors, and if you're not familiar with uh, this kind of a processor approach, I'm going to introduce a, a JTAG, an in-circuit device emulation kind of function. And so what this does inside the processors is you have a tool uh, for doing debug functions. And if I have that tool, it's really, really nice from a software perspective because over in my processor, I have things like registers and address functions. I have peripherals that have data and I.O. devices, my program counter, and all that nifty things. If I'm working on especially a small device like a cell phone or a portable function, I may only have a screen that's about two inches high, maybe a couple of inches wide, and, and it's really hard to embed a lot of printf statements to try to figure out where my code goes. For those of you that write code that way in your classes, you'll understand what I mean. So my software tool has the advantage I can extract all that information out to my software tool. I can look to see what data is in those registers. I can understand what's in the program counter. I can set breakpoints, say run to this point and stop. Let me look at what all's going on. I can manipulate those registers. I can change them. I can force them to go to certain values. From an attacker standpoint, an adversary and a product, this is probably also the number one most powerful tool they have in getting into most products. Why? Because they can set it up, you can start the processor, you can single step through the code, you can see exactly what's going on. They may run all kinds of obfuscation techniques, have very poor structure, doesn't make any difference because you don't care. All you want to know is that the code is walking through a sequence of events and you can see what's going on. I have a piece of software that says, ask the user for a password, go verify it, return pass or fail. If I'm watching it through this kind of a tool, that's okay. When it gets to that routine, I say, go do that, break when you get back. In reality, and this is why I said before, it's important to understand the differences, that pass or fail piece that you put in your, your code, whether it be Java or C code, is down at a register. It says, if register 3 is 0, go over there because you've, quote unquote, passed. If it's not 0, go over here because you failed. But I can change the register 3 to whatever value that I want. I don't care whether I pass the particular password function. I just walk over there, and now I can execute that code. So from an attacker standpoint, this is a tool that allows you to have full control of a device. By the way, if you're doing uh, security functions and you're doing cryptography and keys, if you're doing it in software, those keys walk through these registers. So if somebody has a tool like this and they want to know what your key is, they just have to watch the registers. There goes your key. So be aware of what can happen in this space. So we've introduced a concept that we've called protected JTAG. JTAG is the, is the IEEE standard definition, um, 1146, I believe it is, that, that defines how you interact with this kind of function. So we're introducing a change called a protected JTAG. Protected JTAG essentially breaks this line from the software tools into the JTAG port in the processor. So now when I'm running code, I have all of these register informations in the processor. I don't see anything at all in the outside world. The traditional choice given to most product developers gave you two options. You could either eliminate JTAG, take it off, which meant all your information inside the processor was secure. People couldn't use these kind of tools to see it. However, your software developers didn't really have much of a clue what was going inside this box. Apply power to your processor and nothing happened. Where did it go? No clue. So you had to do things like build special versions or something of that nature to try to figure out how to get at that and hope that your special version acted exactly like your normal version. Otherwise, you didn't necessarily know what's going on. Or you go into your product development team and say, I'm going to let the JTAG function be there. Here's all these software development tools. Get it done faster, better, cheaper. That's great, but we're going to have to live with the fact that attackers out there and, and our adversaries are going to have this to attack our products.
So we've added a, a, a new component to this called a secure server. And this is an interesting standard approach. We looked at it from...